Hello, this is Flipped Harbor for Precalculus. In this video, we'll be going over section 3.5, the real zeros of a polynomial function. Our objectives for this lesson are to utilize the remainder and factor theorems, use Descartes' rule of signs to determine the number of positive and negative real zeros of a polynomial function, use the rational zeros theorem to list the potential rational zeros of a polynomial function, find the real zeros of a polynomial function, Utilize the bounds to zeros theorem and use the intermediate value theorem. Our topics include zeros, the factor theorem, remainders. We'll be using synthetic division a lot through the next couple sections. We'll look at Descartes' rule of signs and rational zeros theorem. Our outline for this video will start with the remainder theorem and then use synthetic division to find the value of a function. We'll look at the factor theorem, Descartes' rule of signs, Look at a theorem that tells us the number of zeros for a polynomial function. We'll look at the rational zeros theorem. We'll find the real zeros of a polynomial function. And we'll look at some bounds on zeros. Now our remainder theorem says that if we have a polynomial function, and that polynomial function is being divided by the binomial x minus c, then the remainder is equal to what we would get if we plug that c value into the polynomial. So we have a polynomial here for an example. f of x equals negative 4x cubed plus 5x squared plus 8. And we want to divide it by the binomial x plus 3. Now remember, our theorem deals with dividing by the binomial x minus c. So my c value here is actually a negative 3. So we're going to go through the synthetic division process because it's a whole lot easier than trying to do long division. And we're going to take a look at what the remainder is and show that it's equal to what I would get if I plugged negative 3 into the function. So I run my synthetic division, drop the negative 4 straight down, multiply and add all the way across, and we see that our remainder is 161. Now the remainder theorem says that if I plug negative 3 into the function, I should also get 161, which I do. So we can use that. We can use this idea of the remainder theorem to actually use synthetic division to find, find the value of a function. So here we have a new function, f of x, and we want to find f of negative 3. So instead of plugging negative 3 into the polynomial, what I can do is run synthetic division. Now, you may think, well, why bother? I've got a fancy schmancy calculator to just plug negative 3 in. That's true. But this is actually easier if you don't have the fancy schmancy calculator. Think about trying to do this by hand. If you didn't have the fancy calculator, this could be a pain in the butt because of the fourth power and all the multiplying and the subtracting that's going on. you got a lot of chance to screw stuff up. You're actually less likely to screw up the synthetic division. So we run synthetic division. Negative 3 is in the corner block for my synthetic division. I go through the whole process, and I see that my remainder is 185. Now, as long as I did everything right, that means that f of negative 3 is equal to 185. So I don't have to go through that whole process of plugging the value into the polynomial. I can just run synthetic division. All right, let's take a look at the factor theorem. It says let f be a polynomial function again. Then x minus c is a factor of f if and only if f of c equals 0. Now, if we kind of tie this together, that means that our remainder is 0. So if I plug 2, in this case, into my polynomial, and I get 0, that means that 2 is a root, or 0, and that means that x minus 2 is a factor. Okay, now you need to make that connection now. If we know a 0, we can then create a factor. And we're going to be doing that a lot. So you've got to get your head wrapped around that right now. For every 0, there is a factor that goes along with it. So f of 2 in this case does equal 0. So that means that x minus 2 is a factor of that polynomial. Now that's going to be huge in a little bit. Try to remember, for every 0, 
there is a factor x minus the number. Okay, now let's get into something big here. Descartes rule of sign. Okay, he came up with a process that tells us how many positive zeros there are. That is, um, literally positive numbers that are zeros of our polynomial and how many negative zeros we have. Now, it's not super cut and dry. It's not super straightforward. There's still a little bit of wishy-washiness to this, but let's take a look at it. Let f denote a polynomial function again. That's what we're working with, polynomial functions and it's written in standard form. Now what that means is you've got the powers lined up in order from smallest to biggest. You know, your last number should be your constant. Okay? If you don't have that constant value, factor an x out. So x is one of your factors and then you've got the polynomial. Okay? You want that constant added or subtracted at the end. Uh, it says that the number of positive real zeros of f, okay, so again, we're talking about zeros that are positive numbers, either equals the number of sign changes of the non-zero coefficients of f of x, or it equals that number less an even integer. Now, that sounds really goofy. Obviously, we're going to take a look at an example. But we count the sign changes in the polynomial, and that will tell us how many positive zeros there are. It continues on, the number of negative real zeros of f either equals the number of, that's supposed to be sign changes, not sing changes, of the non-zero coefficients of f of negative x, that is that you plug a negative x into the function, or it equals that number less an even integer. So let's take a look at, example, at an example here. f of x equals x to the fifth plus x to the fourth plus x squared plus x plus one. Now notice there's no sign changes. Every single term is positive. So there's no sign changes in my original polynomial. That means that there are zero positive zeros of the polynomial. No sign changes, no positive zeros. If we take a look at f of negative x, now let me tell you a quick way to do this. Change the sign on every odd power of x. So I change the sign on my x to the fifth. I change the sign on my negative x. I left the sign the same on any even powers and on that constant on the end. So we see that there are three sign changes. The first term is negative. The second term is positive. That's a sign change plus x squared, then negative x, that's a sign change. Negative x to plus 1, that's a sign change. So there are three sign changes. That means that there are three or one negative zeros of the function. Now, I'll tell you why we take away two in a section or so. Okay, I'm not going to bother telling you why we take away two right now. It doesn't really matter. But you take away an even number from the number of sign changes. So since there's three sign changes, there's three possible negative zeros, or take away two, there's one possible negative zero of the function. Okay. Again, I'll tell you why in a section or so. Now, if we had a whole bunch of sign changes, let's say we had five sign changes, that would be five possible zeros, or three possible zeros or one possible zero. I took away four and I took away two. Again, I'm not going to bother to explain why right now. All right, so let's look at another theorem. The number of zeros for a polynomial has to be equal to its degree or less. If you have a cubic function, that is your highest power is three, you can have at most three real zeros. Now you might only have one real zero or well actually technically and I'm not going to tell you why it has to have three or one. If you have a polynomial with four as the highest power then at most it's going to have four real zeros. The rational zeros theorem, now this is big, you've seen this in Algebra 2 so this is not new but you know I'll be totally honest you're not going to think it's fun. If let f be a polynomial function of degree 1 or higher of the form, blah, blah, blah. So basically, it's in standard form. 
where each coefficient is an integer. If it's not an integer, then you know, let's try to make it an integer. You know, we'll multiply the whole function by 2 if we needed to get rid of some fractions or something like that. If p divided by q in lowest terms is a rational 0 of f, so let's say 1 third is a rational 0, then p must be a factor of a to the 0, a sub 0. Now that's the constant at the end. We have to have that constant at the end. And q must be a factor of a to the n excuse me, a sub n. That's the um, leading coefficient. You've done this before. You did p's over q's back in Algebra 2. We're going to do it again. We have to revisit this. This is a really powerful tool for solving for polynomials, for factoring polynomials. It's important. We're going to revisit this. Now, let's find the real zeros of a polynomial function. And there's a process that the book spells out. And that's what we're going to talk about here is this process. It's a series of steps. The first thing we're going to do is look at the degree of the polynomial to determine the maximum number of zeros. If we've got a cubic function, we can have at most three real zeros. Now, why is that handy to know? Well, if you go ahead and find your three real zeros, you know to stop. Then we're going to look at Descartes' rule of sign to determine the possible number of positive zeros and negative zeros. So again, we're doing this so we know when to stop. Okay? If we find if Descartes' rule says that there are no positive zeros, then we're not going to try any positive zeros. Then we're going to use this rational zeros theorem. If a polynomial has integer coefficients, use the rational zeros theorem to identify those rational zeros that can poten those rational numbers that can potentially be zeros. We're going to use substitution or synthetic division. It's supposed to say or synthetic division to test each potential rational zero. I like to use synthetic division. There's a reason for that. I'll try to you know, explain that through the video and I'll try to explain that in class. Each time that a zero is found, repeat on the depressed equation. That is, when we find a 0, what we're actually going to be doing as we're th synthetically dividing, we're checking zeros using the synthetic division. And when it works, we come up with a new polynomial. And it's depressed. Not that we've called it names or anything and made it feel bad, but we've actually lowered the power. Now, don't forget factoring techniques you already know. You know, special factors like x squared minus 4. You know how to factor that out. Let me click this. You know, if you want to uh, factor by grouping, or once you get to a quadratic, that's kind of like, you know, a big point. When we get it down to a quadratic, you know, confetti goes in the air and we go, oh, we can use the quadratic theorem now. Excuse me, the uh, quadratic equation or even the quadratic program on your calculator. So once we get to that quadratic, that's big. All right, so let's find the zeros for this polynomial, f of x equals x to the fourth minus 3x squared minus 4. We're looking for four zeros at most, probably less. Now, why do I say less? Well, an x to the fourth, where there's some terms missing, notice there's no x cubed, there's no x that kind of removes zeros from uh, the polynomial. So I know I'm looking for 4 at most, but you know my gut is telling me probably less. Now, I use the rational zeros theorem, and my p-values are 4, 2, and 1. That is the uh, factors of the constant at the end. My q-values, well, there's only 1 because my leading coefficient is 1. 1 is the only factor of 1. So my possible p over q values are plus or minus 4, plus, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 1, thanks to the fact that my leading coefficient is 1. Now, let's try one. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you right now. 1 is not a 0. We're going to show that with synthetic division, though. I like to show one that doesn't work, and then we'll see one that does. So if I try to run my synthetic division, I don't get 0 as a remainder. So that means that 1, I should say 1, not negative 1, is not a 0. So since 1 is not a 0, I, I kind of move on. I have to restart, and I have to try something different. So let's try 2. By the way, 
two works. So I run my synthetic division and I see my remainder is zero. Well, since my remainder is zero, that means two things. That means that two is a zero. But another thing that that means is that x minus two is a factor. Now that's cool. If x minus two is a factor and I factor it out, what I'm left with is x cubed plus 2x squared plus x plus 2. Where did I come up with that? Well, that's the 1, 2, 1, 2 from my synthetic division. That's the quote unquote depressed equation. So I am going to run synthetic division on this new polynomial. Well, what should I run? Well, I could try 2 again because it's possible that 2 is a 0 a couple times. That's a multiplicity. It's not, though. I'll tell you that right now. Negative 2 will work. So I run my synthetic division. I get 0 as a remainder. That means that negative 2 is a 0, which means that x plus 2 is a factor. And look right here. When you've got three numbers below your synthetic division, that's x squared plus 0x plus 1. It's a quadratic. Stop. We're going to change gears. We're going to use our quadratic techniques. We're going to try to factor it like it's a quadratic because that's what we're left with. So it's the quadratic x squared plus 1. Let's move that 1 over. Oh, x squared equals negative 1. No real solutions. We'll look at that in a section or so. But right now we just get to go, but ah, it's not real. We're not going to worry about it. So my real zeros are 2 and negative 2. OK, so other uses for this technique. We could use it since we're really just finding the zeros. We're finding where the function equals 0. Well, let's say it was an equation. x to the fourth minus 3x squared minus 4 equals 0. I can use the exact same technique and I find out that my two real solutions for that equation are 2 and negative 2. The work looks exactly the same. But here's a big thing. I can use it to factor that polynomial. Remember I told you that 2 was a 0? That means x minus 2 is a factor. Negative 2 is a 0? That means x plus 2 is a factor. Now that's cool because I can rewrite it all factored out x minus 2, x plus 2, and then that binomial that wouldn't factor anymore. So that's big, that's powerful, because now we can factor polynomials that we would not have been, been able to factor otherwise. So that's big. Okay, This is a technique that we can use for factoring as well. Alright, let's talk about this idea of bounds on 0. Now, they present this after the other techniques because it gets a little mucky. Sometimes it's not useful, sometimes it is useful. It says let f be a polynomial function. Okay, that's not new. We're talking about polynomial function whose leading coefficient is 1. Now that's important. Our leading coefficient is 1. If it's not 1, we've got to factor that number out. A bound m on the zeros of f is the smaller of these two numbers. Okay, and I'll, we'll obviously go through an example where max means choose the larger entry in the braces. Those curvy brackety things are called braces. So let's do this zero bound on our polynomial. Now I'm, I'm going to be totally honest. You know, I've already worked through this. I've I found out the answer. This is not useful in this case, and we'll discuss why. We'll discuss when it is useful. So we need to find these two max values. We need to find these two numbers. So the first thing is the max of 1 or all of our coefficients added together. Actually, the absolute value of all of our coefficients added together. And then we've got this 1 plus the max of our absolute value of our coefficients. So the way that this looks for us is the max of 1 or the absolute value of 4 plus the absolute value of negative 3. Now 4 plus 3 is 7. So 
that first max, I have to choose what's bigger, 1 or 7. Well, obviously it's 7. Looking at the other side, 1 plus the max of our absolute value coefficients. So I have to choose the max of 4 or 3. Well, the max of 4 or 3 is 4. 1 plus 4 is 5. <sighs> Still not done. Now I need to choose the lesser of these two numbers. Oh, let's see, which number is smaller, 7 or 5? Oh, yeah, it's 5. So what that does is that tells us that our zeros are limited to between negative 5 and 5. Now that's not real useful because my p over q values, the biggest number I had was 4. So this bounds on 0 can be useful. A lot of times it's not. I'll be totally honest. They, they make a whole section in our homework. Find the bounds of the zeros. You're not even going to use it other than that section where they say find the bounds on your zeros. Okay, It's a lot of work without a big payoff usually. So that's it. You've seen a lot of this already. You've seen the P over Q stuff. There's a lot of stuff you haven't seen. I want to spend a couple days on this, but it's time for you to get to work on some of this homework. Pay attention to what they're asking, though. There's a whole section where they want you to list the potential rational zeros, but not go through the process of finding them. So basically, that entire section of questions, they want you to find P over Q and do nothing with it. So don't break your back trying to see which of those works. You're just making a list. All right, time to get started on that homework. I'll see you in class, and I'll see you online.